this is the backside of the temple of Osiris at Abydos. And it doesn't look like much because the beautiful work is inside the building. You go down that set of stairs, a long set of stairs, and then you enter where there are huge round columns. Uh, it's a massive com internal complex. But what's intriguing and stupefies a lot of people is that below the surface is where you find the megalithic. This is the Osirion. And you can see there's water in it. The water is coming up from the ground. And the question is, how much older is this than that? Because this was buried under the sand. Whenever you're ready, Dr. Mailer. Well, this is the Osirion at Abydos. It is behind the, the known temple, which they call the Temple of Seti. It was the Temple of Osiris. And amazingly, they date this temple, they, uh, at the same time period as the temple in front, which is impossible. This is huge blocks of granite. It's the only granite temple in the south. Our teacher, Abdel Hakim, dated this at 50,000 years, at the same age of the Valley Temple. There's no inscriptions inside the temple. The only inscriptions on top appear much, much older, clearly not from the same time period. Again, you can never date a temple from what the inscriptions are. But there's no inscriptions inside. And this is huge blocks of granite, weighing 100 tons at least. At least. At least. And how far are we from the actual quarry? Uh, well, the quarry is, is uh, Aswan, mm -hmm. so less than 100 miles. But still, 100 miles. Yes. And <clears throat> these blocks weigh... Oh, north. We're further than Luxor. Iowa. It's probably oh, 200 miles. Oh, 200 miles. 200 miles, because he's, uh, as Yusuf just said, we're north of Luxor. Exactly. I was contemplating from Luxor. Okay, but this, these, some of these blocks are 100, 100 tons is, is a good estimate yes. of, of the size. Yes, uh, 200 tons. Okay. Would say. 200 tons here. <laughs> Look at this major block right over here. Yeah. Because part of the ceiling. Iowa, part of the ceiling, right there, the ceiling of the temple. And was the it? The on the other side over there was made by the grandson of Sethi. Ah, okay. That's right. That's and and, and w right. was it at one time buried completely? Yeah. Before the high dam. Oh, the high dam the is high what's dam. ruined this. Uh -huh. Before the high dam, you could go down into the rooms, and the, the Yosef and Patricia have posted pictures on the Kemet site that they have been down in there when the water's down. Mm -hmm. It's an incredible experience to go in these chambers. I've been waiting for years. I'll keep coming back until I can get in there. Get in there. <laughs>67? Yeah. Okay, so that's 67 tons. Yeah. This vertical one, conservatively measured. I think it's measured. conservative. <laughs> that is conservative. And you have to be, you 200 have to be miles from exactly the Exactly, you'll work. Otherwise you get trashed. That's right. <laughs> have, you, say 100 tons. have you had a chance, Chris, to, to uh, measure the, like the, the vertical in terms of how close it is to being... We can't. We no, never got down in there. Down. Yes, you never, never got down, down in there. Oh, you never been That's in. That's why I can't speak to the precision. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Sure, he has to be up close. Okay. I've got to measure it before yeah. I Oh, yeah. Definitely. There have been times that we can get in there. Seven Seven outside, outside, right? Right? So this is the present level of the desert, and this is the Temple of Osiris in the background. The beautiful work is down inside of it. The staircase drops down into it. Giant columns and things. Very beautiful, but again, what you're looking at is the horizon, and what's incredible is this, which is under the horizon. 
This is the Osirion. Whereas the temple of Osiris is made out of sand, uh, limestone, which is reasonably soft material, this is made out of granite. Red granite from Aswan. So it had to be moved about 200 miles each block to its present location. We've conservatively estimated that the bigger blocks are at least 65 tons each in weight. So the question is, how is it shaped, being Hello. such a hard rock? Hello. And also, Hello. also uh, not only that, how was it moved? How was it finished? Hello. And why is it under, seemingly underground? Some of the conventional Egyptologists believe that the Osirion was built at the same time as the Temple of Osiris, but the materials are completely different, this being much more difficult to work with. And again, this is so much lower below the ground, or present day ground, this could have actually been ground level at the time of its construction. Much, much older than conventional archaeology tells us. And that tube-like tunnel is much more modern. It's the giant blocks and the fact that there is no mortar or cement or glue. They sit on top of each other. We're now at the Red Pyramid, which is next to the Bent Pyramid. And we're very fortunate because this one we get to go into. <clears throat> so what'll be intriguing for me is to see how big the passageway is to get into the Red Pyramid. How, like how wide is it? How tall is it? And of course this pyramid, like most, uh, are believed by Egyptologists to have been tombs. The other more intriguing theory, which is far more complicated and I think far more plausible, is that these were power plants, electrical generators. So therefore, it'll be interesting to see, is this a passageway inside to where the tomb of the king is? Or is it a passageway, a servant, uh, servants, not servants, sorry, service entrance to the internal workings of a very, very ancient machine that predates history as we know it, as in older, than 6,000 years ago, older than the pharaohs, older than the dynastic Egyptians. Okay, we're up on the Red Pyramid, and Saqqara is in the background. Over that side is Giza. The pyramids are lined up, but not in a straight line. It's actually a Fibonacci spiral. And next, we're going to go inside the Red Pyramid. Oh, I'll be glad to. Yeah. Thank you. At this point, I'm going to have to, I'm going to, have to uh, turn on a light. Because uh, this is a maintenance shaft. This is not a walkway. It's a hell of a lot deeper than I thought it would be. Again, going into something which covers several acres. This isn't the greatest of the Great Pyramids, but this is a damn big pyramid, I'll tell you that much. Okay, this is at the bottom of the shaft entrance into the Red Pyramid. Uh, hundreds of feet that we came down at an angle. Again, you see, three feet by three feet is the basic dimension. Oh! Now we turn and enter the core of the Red Pyramid in Egypt. Mark has a torch, so this is how you can see almost the baffling that's on the in the interior of the Red Pyramid. Definitely for resonance or acoustics, wouldn't you say, Mark? Absolutely. 
not as a tomb, because these have a pragmatic function, clearly. Okay, the opening's about six feet high, so it's a relief compared to the three foot main shaft entrance. Same thing, you have these baffle-like projections going up. But this room's oriented 90 degrees compared to the other one. So it's the sonic effect in here, reverberation, etc., which is amazing. If you hit the right tone, then the whole room vibrates. And again, that lends credence or credence to the idea that this was not the tomb of a dead king, but that this had a very pragmatic function, and that was a vi vibrational function. One thing, one thing that uh, Yusuf Awian just pointed out, who is our oral tradition expert and guide, is that this is the original, the color is going to be crap in this video, but it's the best I can do. You see the white, that's the original limestone color. And then the exterior surface now is a yellowish, reddish, brownish color. It's a staining from something, but the question is staining from what? <clears throat> Not simply time, it's as if there was some kind of liquid or chemical that was inside of this pyramid that stained the stone. Airborne, or was it part of the function? This will give you a much better idea here because there's an actual light. But the color here, you can see where it's, it looks like it's been, well, you can see where it's been dripping down. But again, the acoustics are just phenomenal in the Red Pyramid in Egypt. So people are toning away in here because this thing has astonishing resonance properties. Again, adding credence to the idea that it was a pragmatic building when it was constructed and not a tomb. And the precision you can see here. This groove you see is deceit or is, isn't really uh, a good example of the precision of the fit of the work because it's channeled in left and right like that. So you've got like this Y, sh this V shape going in. That's not a good example, but as we come down to where the stone's been broken, here, look at that. I don't even know if you can see that, but that is a join between two stones, and it's so close together, you can't fit anything in there. I don't even know if water could, could seep into that. That is really, that's out of this world. So again, it's my belief, and 
that of many others, especially those who uh, know a lot more about the pyramids and this part of Egypt that I do, or than I do, that this was an inheritance from a much older culture, long before the pharaohs. And that they were built as pragmatic power stations, not as tombs. It is believed from this philosophy that in fact these are the oldest of the pyramids, the ones which are stone and encased in stone, and much later, or later at least, are the ones made out of mud brick. So the conventional belief, again, is that the one we will visit next at Saqqara, that that was an early experiment because it's a step pyramid, and that through the perfection over the course of only a couple or a few hundred years, that they reached this potential. But the more intriguing idea is that it's the complete opposite that the greatest and finest craftsmanship of the stone pyramids was first, but done by a civilization long before the Pharaonic Egyptians. And then later, once that civilization had disappeared, possibly via a cataclysm, that the Pharaonic Egyptians show up, see these magnificent structures, and they attempt to replicate them but they can never match the quality of the workmanship because they didn't have the tools. Okay, we're at the site of Dashur, which was the southern border of what we call Land of Osiris, and it features three pyramids here. Two are ancient, one is not. This one here is the ben so-called Ben Pyramid. It, uh, supposedly it was a mistake. We don't believe there were any mistakes. There's a double two, two angles. One that starts out at 55, then ends at 41. And supposedly they, they say that this was a mistake and the king didn't want this and then had the other pyramid built. But uh, 1968, Marshall McLuhan came here, Canadian, uh, wrote the book The Medium is the Message. He looked at this pyramid and says it produces two frequencies of sound. And he was the first one to come to the under ancient understanding. The title of this site supposedly was a king's title, Seneferu. The Egyptologists say that means he of beauty. No, we say it means double harmony. It was not a person's name or even a title. It could be a title to the site. It could be just this pyramid which produces two frequencies of sound, or this pyramid and the so-called red pyramid, which we'll see later, that produce another frequency of sound. That this was an active living site. Where you're pointing, where you're actually filming now, you can see sand dunes. There's silt in there. We have collected soil samples, like an aqueduct that brought water from the west to this site. This was an active site. There was temples here, and when we go to the other pyramid, you'll see docks where boats used to come. So this site was over 12,000 years old. Now the third pyramid that's down there is a so-called black pyramid. That is mostly mud brick collapsed. We know it is a Middle Kingdom construction about. 1800 BCE, uh, associated with two kings, it's not sure who it was, one is Amenhotep II, another Senusert, but we know for sure that it's what we call a symbolic perka, a symbolic tomb, no one was ever buried in there, but there's no resonance, no sound. So there's no way this structure is built n uh, right after this structure, and it's the same type of technology. It's thousands and thousands of years of difference. This such structure is over 12,000 years, this is 1800 BCE. And it's collapsed, mostly mud brick with very little limestone. Again, one of the keys, it seems, to the bent pyramid is the fact that it still has the limestone casing on it, more so than many other pyramids, and the fact that it's the corners. All four corners are damaged. Now, of course, people are going to say that's where the plundering for building materials from later times came from, but there's a very good chance that what it's indicative of is damage to the pyramid as the result of a massive earthquake causing the four corners to crumble more so than the facing of the sides. I'm not a earthquake expert, but it makes sense to me that if you have energy running along a flat surface such as this, where it meets a corner, that's going to be a place of destabilization. And so it's quite clear, I think, that, uh, that here we're looking 
at a massive, ancient, very ancient pre-pharaonic construction that had a pragmatic uh, function, that of an energy generator, as were the uh, pyramids on the Giza Plateau, and that a major event, catastrophic, planetary in scale, happened about 12,000 years ago, causing major damage to this structure and others, and therefore turning off the function of the power plant. It's believed that they were fed by water, not from the Nile, which is here, but from the earlier Nile, which was west of the present-day Nile. And that is why there is a profusion of tunnel systems running from the west towards the east, that the water entered the pyramid underneath, and that there was a process by which water was broken into its components of hydrogen and oxygen, and the hydrogen is what was used to generate the power. And what level of power? Some say microwave, some say many different levels of, uh, and functions of the power itself. Evidence of ancient machining technology in Egypt. This is a new book uh, that I've just written, and it presents the evidence. At the Aswan Quarry in southern Egypt, we find, among other things, the unfinished obelisk, which would have weighed 1,200 tons had it been completed. Quite an amazing achievement, and something beyond the capability of the dynastic Egyptians, because Egyptologists tell us that these stone pounders were what were used to create. Then also at Elephantine Island, we find this amazing rose granite, a single piece of stone shaped with amazing ability and other examples at Elephantine Island as well. Just to the north, we have the Tomb of the Nobles. These, of course, were tombs, but these chambers were cut into sandstone. Not just columns inside, but hallways extending 30, 40 feet. And at the Ramesseum, here we have the kneecap and the foot of a sculpture out of rose granite that weighed supposedly a thousand tons. And nearby, the Colossi of Memnon. The one on the left is basically one single piece of stone weighing 720 tons. The Dendera light bulbs, if they are light bulbs, are very intriguing. Here we see possibly a giant holding one of these. And then nearby at Abydos, these strange figures. As well, the Osirion, again rose granite. And astonishingly, it is several feet lower than the ground at this point. And at Karnak, which is a huge place, we have this massive obelisk out of rose granite. Now, the dynastic Egyptians could have made these columns out of several pieces, but the obelisk? As well, the remains of an obelisk whose core has been destroyed. Some theorize that ancient technology was used here, such as these obvious core drill holes. Now, of course, in modern times, we have tube drills, but did the ancient Egyptians have these? Or are we looking at lost ancient technology, much older? And the result of a cataclysm destroyed the culture that made them. As well, the bent pyramid here, which some people believe was an engineering mistake. But you see the fineness of the fit of stones. And also at Dashur, we have the red pyramid, which we went inside of. How could people possibly think that these were tombs 
These baffles obviously were made for acoustic purposes. And Saqqara, where we have these huge boxes at the so-called Serapium. Here the Kemet School is inspecting these. Yusuf Awiyan, the expert, is reading the glyphs. We measured the flatness of the surfaces. This is a perfect 90 degree angle. And how could someone possibly think that these inscriptions were done by the same people who made the box? As well, this schist disc in the museum in Cairo, recorded as being a flower pot or fruit plate, but it's obviously technology. And at Abusir, we have Yusuf Awiyan inspecting what clearly is a saw shaped piece of basalt. And as well, we have more curious drill holes like this. In detail, you can see how the drill entered the hard granite. And as well, we have Yusuf inspecting a shaped piece of hard stone. And again, more of these drill holes. At Abu Ghurab, this huge hotep composed of five pieces of stone, obviously from the same quarry, more evidence of tube drilling. And also these amazing bowls, thought by some to be for ritual blood of bulls, but why is the hole on the side and not at the bottom? And there are also other bowls which have three holes on the side, not the bottom. The Giza Plateau, we see the obvious quarrying of megalithic stone for the construction of the Great Pyramid and others. And what remains of the casing stone you can see is a perfect fit. Most people don't know that the Great Pyramid actually has eight sides, but it's very subtle. And here again, we see saw marks in basalt, which is almost as hard as diamond. The Dynastic Egyptians could not have cut this stone. And in the interior of the Great Pyramid, again, this baffling system in the ascending passage, the Grand Gallery. We see the weathering of the stone of the Sphinx, Precision here with Chris Dunn, within two ten thousandths of an inch of perfectly flat. Massive col uh, columns of basalt, or sorry, granite, brought from 500 miles away. And Yusuf showed me obvious evidence of tunnels and shafts descending into the bedrock of the Giza Plateau. We went down into the third level and obviously water was once running through the system. So here is my book and it's available at Amazon.com under my name, Ryan Forster.